All right, so I have to make this video. Somebody, somebody, I'm I'm doing container D commands and I'm like, what's CTR? And this LVG answered the the question about you know what's the difference between container D and Docker, and I love this answer. I just have to share it. LVG DN says to put it short, Docker is container D plus other other stuff on top of it that's useless for Kubernetes. <laughs> and that's that's kind of my take on it. Um, this is a very short video. So of the container engines that exist, and, and, and maybe, maybe I'll go to make a point mode. Here we go. This is make a point mode. Behold. Um, also, it gives me a better thumbnail. So there, let's go through the container engines, right? So I believe it's called the container runtime interface. It's a Kubernetes thing. It's, Kubernetes has got all these acronyms that define pieces of architecture that have to be there. Again, Kubernetes is a specification. It's not software. It specifies how software should be and how it should work. Uh, Creo is still better. And we're going to, that's a great fight to have. Okay. Uh, and, and so here we have, uh, you know, I'm using container D most people these days. I'm just going to cut to the chase. Everybody uses container D today. A few, uh, people, you know, use Creo, which is an even light. We're going to get into what the differences are, but a few people use Creo. Almost never, nobody still uses Docker Community Edition or Docker as their container engine, particularly since I think it's been now two years since Kubernetes officially kicked Docker out <laughs> and said, we don't want any Docker. <laughs> and apparently, apparently my reactions from my Mac Pro are in favor of kicking Docker out. And so there's no Docker, right? Why no Docker? Docker is the devil. I've made videos about this before. The Docker company, the original founder of Docker is long gone, moved on to pursue other interests. And Docker is seriously the devil. Um, uh, it doesn't have a, a CRT term. No, it doesn't. And that's the biggest argument against it, which we will talk about in a second. So um, the now that Docker is out, and, and let, let's just really quickly summarize why Docker is the devil and why it's out. Number one, Docker has pulled fast ones on people in the business world for a long time and the people in the open source world. The company actually pulled the rug out from several open source projects that said, you can't store your stuff here and they ended up making charging money even though they're open source and it was a huge fiasco and they couldn't even get to their own containers. And the entire open source world said, whoa, we're out of here. And so what do they do? They all go to the GitHub container registry these days. GHCR is where you'll see images coming and getting pulled from, or they decide to run their own registries like Harbor, like uh, Kubernetes itself and a bunch of other places because they're just done with Docker. Uh, there are still some images that are being hosted on Docker Hub, but nobody you know, who's paying any attention wants any dependency on this, this horrible, horrible company. Docker also turned around and tried to charge uh, everybody who was running Docker on the desktop, uh, money overnight, they gave them like six months and then they, they pushed it out farther because all of a sudden they're saying, Hey, enterprises, we're going bankrupt and now you have to pay. And so everybody clamored. This was two years ago. Everybody clamored to try to find an alternative for the desktop to run containers for small projects and things like that. And people tried Podman desktop. There was a, at one point there was a, uh, what was the other one? Um, uh, open, open, what was the open container? Uh, Quay. Yeah. There've been tons of alternatives. It, it turned out that pod, pod is usually the winner when it comes to like desktop con, uh, container engines and, and tools. Uh, Podman is kind of one in that space. It's, you know, Red Hat, whether you love them or hate them, they've decided that it's also safer because it doesn't, you know, have that socket issue going on. If you don't want any of that is, then you just have to study containers and in short Docker is the devil. Nobody wants to use it anymore and nobody should use it. And so what are you going to use, right? The entire Kubernetes infrastructure was based on Docker originally. Well, that's no longer been the case. It hasn't been the case for something like two years. So what is the case now is that a lot of things have emerged to replace it. And I'm going to name the top three things. Uh, we're, we're talking, okay, we're talking about container engines right now, not uh, tools for running containers on your desktop. They're different. So Podman and Docker uh, Scopio, Builda, all those things that you use to deal with containers and move them around, those tools and stuff, those are not in this, the scope of conversation right now. Set those aside. What we're talking about is a container engine. In other words, I want to put a container engine on a thing because I want to run Kubernetes or I want to run Minikube or I want to run, which is Kubernetes, or I want to run Nomad, right? Uh, and all of these things require containers. And and some of them share, they all have, they all have similarities. In particular, Nomad and Kubernetes are 
uh, very interesting because they both require a container engine and they both require uh, something that started as a Kubernetes standard called the Container Network Interface. Um, so the CNI, and that's the way the container does networking and how it talks to each other and how containers network with each other. And so these are all related to the conversation. Um, they all are built, obviously, container, these containers we're talking about are not jails, they're not BSD. They're all built on something called LXC. And a lot of people would argue from the Linux community that LXC is the one true way to use a container. And it's really low level, and that uses something called C groups. And there's actually a, a low level component called run C, which has become the abstraction of how to run a container uh, on top of LXC. And that has now become sort of a dependent piece of this. All of these things use run C. Why is this important? Because all of the container engines that I'm going to talk about have different layers of complexity and bloat that are layered on top of run C more or less. Okay. So Creo, which our friend is LBG has been mentioning is by far the lightest. It is super duper lightweight. It's this teeny tiny wrapper of run C. It's pretty much just run C. And for that reason, if you need to debug a container or you want to do Docker type things like, you know, exec into a container or see it or LS it or remove the image and all these different things, a lot of those functions are not included with the command line tools to use, uh, to use uh, uh, that. Uh, there are a number of utilities that relate to all of this uh, new container engines stuff, some of which I actually am kind of deficient skills wise in. Uh, one of them is Cree CTL. So uh, CRI CTL. This is called Container Runtime uh, Interface. So all the container engines since Kubernetes made the, 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 the declaration, thou shalt define and follow the Container Runtime Interface, every container engine on the planet that matters uses CRI. And so this tool has been maintained that interfaces directly with anything that speaks CRI. Now, but the Container Runtime Interface doesn't cover everything that you would want to do with Docker or Podman. And so you may be like thinking, oh my God, where did my commands go, right? And that is because the container runtime interface has been designed for Kubernetes. That's where the comment at the beginning of the video comes in, uh, that it, it's, it's not the stuff that you would want to do on a desktop. So it's eliminated a lot of those things that you might want uh, for better or worse, right? And then so each container runtime engine has decided, okay, how much are we going to add on top of the base functionality of run C and CRI? And CNI, the container networking interface, which defines how they talk to each other. So um, you know, if you're trying to, if you're just trying to get containers to work, uh, on your desktop, this is not the video for you. This is the video for which engine should I pick? So Creo is CRI dash O is it, when we first used it two years ago was rather immature and it didn't really work and it had some bugs in it. Um, and, but it, but it, since it's, it's come around, I'm not going to use it though for reasons I'll talk about later. It's the lightest weight. It's the smallest engine you can possibly run on a node. Uh, whether it's a virtual or a real node being a machine. Um, and you, you know, it's the smallest thing you can get. It's just ba baseline layer on top of run C. Uh, and it, it step up from that and you get container D. Container D is kind of the legacy from Docker and Docker CE. Uh, and as actually, unfortunately, the packages, if you want a package install of container D, uh, you still have to go to the Docker project. Uh, uh, for those things. And that is why I wrote my own, uh, installer for container D based on container D's documentation. Uh, that is not a package, but this is all the stuff that you would get from a package. This is how you install container D. This adds bash completion for container D. This installs run C. It reinstalls the, the container D plugins for CNI and all of that stuff. Now, why would you pick container D over, OC, over, run, over, uh, just, um, you know, Creo. Uh, Creo is the default for OpenShift. Yeah, but OpenShift is a Red Hat offering and they have more control over the container engines. They don't want people, OpenShift is more of a one solution meets, you know, come is, is good for everybody kind of thing. And they want lightweight, you know, so they don't want to impact their thing. Plus, usually if you're doing OpenShift, you're already deploying Red Hat. And so Red, you know, OpenShift plus Red Hat equals, you know, joy for them in enterprise. Um, and, and so they, they, they kind of control the whole ecosystem. So they really don't want people poking around in the container engine, but if you're me or you're any other, a lot of other people in their home lab or some other thing, sometimes you want to use that container engine on that node for other purposes, or you want to, you just don't trust, uh, the minimalism of Creo and other things like that, because you really want to see what's going on when Kubernetes stops working and you want to go, you know, look, kick, you know, get under the hood or whatever and see what's actually going on. And the only way you can actually see what's going on in container engine is, um, uh, I should be, yeah, well it's, it is now. 
Creo was not battle tested two years ago. It was not. It was throwing all kinds of errors in our test cases at work. And so we decided, decided not to do it. Um, you know, the, these technologies are evolving all the time. So you probably want to reevaluate every year whether you want to do it. But if you're deploying a cluster and that cluster is going to be around for a year or two, uh, which is probably a bad idea, by the way, you should be automatically updating your clusters pretty frequently. Otherwise, you're going to get, you know, day two problems in your enterprise. So what container engine you use, that decision is largely up to you. Uh, but if you want more access, you've been using it for five. That doesn't surprise me. A lot of, a lot of advanced people have been using uh, Creo for a long time and making it work. Um, I'm just telling you that when we tried it in our enterprise, uh, that the people who did it, it wasn't me, they had an exceptional number of complications with the container engine in our enterprise. Now, we might have had hardware concerns that were different. Um, but, you know, obviously you have to test all these things out. Creo is the lightest weight. Therefore, it, technically, it probably is going to be the least likely to have problems once it gets stable because there's not a lot of things to maintain. But it also exposes the least amount of things to you under the hood. You have to go through uh, Kubernetes or Nomad or whatever it is to get to the stuff that you want to see um, about the container engine. There's no way to, you know, open the hood or go under the car and see how it's working. You can't, you know, SSH into the box and then run a command that doesn't have anything to do with the, with the thing using the container engine. And that can be, that can be problematic. And by the way, that is primarily the difference between these things. So Creo gives you almost zero access to any of the things that are happening under the hood. Um, you found some small issues, in open PRs for them. Okay, nice. Um, but, and then, and then, but, but you know, it's it's lightweight, blah blah blah. Container D is kind of the step up from that. It's not Docker, but it's heavily inspired by Docker and currently controlled by Docker. And I think that's super important. Container Container D has not yet broken free of the Docker umbrella. If you want to install Container D, it is a separate project, but the project and the, the package installs and everything are still coming from the Docker, the Docker team. Uh, if I'm wrong about that, please, you know, put it in the comments. Be nice. You know, I'm just going on what I last heard. So but as far as I know, as of this moment, the Containerd project it still has ties with Docker. It's so much so that you can't apt install Containerd unless you add the Docker bloat, which includes adding the literal Docker hub uh, package repository to your app repos just to install it by using apt install if you're on Ubuntu. And I'm not doing that. So I wrote a script to do it in the official container D alternative way, which is, you know, download the service and add it to system D, download, you know, the container D stuff, download run C, download the plugins, you know, add an Etsy, an Etsy, Etsy uh, control D uh, config.toml file and modify it using a Toml Python script, which is all in my script. You can go look at it. And, and that's all the stuff that a package install would do for you. But, you know, it's not a package, it's ugly. Um, should somebody make a package for under the app repo that is coming from a distant repository for container D? I think they should, but I don't want to be the one to do it. And if it, do, if it does happen, it should come from the container D project, which right now doesn't seem motivated to do that. They just want to continue to use the one that's being maintained by Docker. So I, I don't know the reason for that, but it's important that you know that you're not getting, you're not free of Docker, uh, you know, things. In fact, there are still some pieces even if Kubernetes that used to be Docker, you have to install a Docker CE package to get them. That might have changed in the last two years. I'm about to find out. So that's a lot to talk about. What about Docker CE Community Edition? Yeah, you can just install Docker CE Community Edition Docker. We're talking about the desktop thing and the Docker, same Docker command and everything. You can use that. You can use that. That will put in the, all the container engine you want on your, on your nodes if you want, but it's got a lot of extra stuff there that doesn't need to be there. Uh, you can use Docker if you want. If you want to install Docker on all those nodes, you can do that too. You can install Podman on those nodes and any of those tools will work, but at each stage in the game, you, 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 you've added more bloat. Um, to give you one solid example, which I think is a bad example, but I'm going to cite it for you anyway. I think this is an anti-pattern. Let me just say it right up front. But our business, when we my, the place that I work, when I first got here, they had people using this. I, I, it makes me sick to even say this because it's such a bad practice. Um, uh, yeah, extra tax service, all kind of thing. We had people that were using, they didn't have Docker on their desktop and they weren't allowed to install it. So we had system administrators who needed to use Docker to, for all the normal Docker things, right? For getting an image and compiling an image and creating a Docker file and all those things, right? They were actually reusing Kubernetes node machines as their personal Docker space. And so they would SSH in, they would SSH in as root because they had root access, the rest of the user base didn't. 
And they say, well, I need Docker. I don't want to put it on my desktop or whatever. And so they would SSH into the root and they would use Docker using the Docker command. And they and their their container images and all their stuff would end up getting intermixed with the stuff being managed by the Kubernetes on that node. That is a major, major violation of best practice best practice. It's one of the biggest anti-patterns in history. I, I can't believe they did it. And and they they did this because they said they didn't have any other way to use Docker. I think that's totally stupid. Thank you for the follow. I thought that was totally stupid. I was like, why are you Who doing this? This is, is so dangerous. Following. And then and then and then the other guys were saying, well, we can't administer our endpoint nodes unless we can use Docker. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they say, like, well, we need to get in there and see what's going on in the container engine. And to be fair, the container engine, Docker container engine in Kubernetes was broken back then. And there were certain cases where the images would stick around and they would bloat out the container engine. Does anybody remember this? This was Kubernetes version, whatever. I don't remember what version it was. But there was a time when Kubernetes had a legitimate bug in it that caused containers to sit there forever and not ever get cleaned out. And the only way to clean up those images was to SSH over with Docker and then delete all the extraneous images and make sure they weren't being used by Kubernetes. Which, if you're a Kubernetes admin, I mean, the whole you know promise of Kubernetes is to save you from that crap, and they did not do that. Oh, my God. And it was, it was horrible. I don't ever want to go back to that world... Um, you know, it's been two or three years since I really looked at that level of Kubernetes that deeply. I'm doing it now in my home lab. But the point I'm trying to make is um, if if you didn't get, if you weren't burned by, people who have been burned by not being able to manipulate the images that are in the container runtime engine on their on their endpoint nodes, people who have been burned by that like we were, they're very, very leery of Creo because they don't have the access to do that. They don't. They don't have the same debugging and administration access to the underlying container image that was absolutely essential to restoring Kubernetes functionality when that bug existed. And so they've been burned by that, and they're like, "Oh hell no! I am not doing that. I want access to my container engine, you know, attack surface and security or not. I don't care. I'm going to go do it." And maybe they have other, you know, bad reasons like I need a Docker engine someplace. So I don't want to put it on my desktop because Docker. I have to pay for it now which is stupid. That's totally stupid. Don't do that. But if, but that, so they've been burned by it. So, so a lot of people have sort of landed on this middle ground and, and the middle ground, I, I personally believe the most popular container engine right now, um, and is, yeah, I'll definitely link to the Z. Um, the, I, I think that the most, the most, uh, the most popular container engine today, particularly for home labs is container D uh, for that reason, it has the level of access for tweaking and watching what's going on with your images, even if it's just for learning purposes. Um, and it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't hobble you when you try to see what's actually happening under the hood, uh, like Creo does, but it also, you know, it, it, it's, it's kind of on that side. So it gives you more access into it. So people like me that are uncomfortable with the absolute minimum of Creo. And by the way, I did try to run a Kubernetes cluster with Creo and tested it when I did my last Kubernetes cluster. And then I realized that I couldn't do anything in the image. And that was when I decided I did not want anything to do with it um, because I, I wanted to be able to, to tinker. And that is why that I have chosen Container D all of my peers at work, including the ones that, by the way, the people who did that shit in the cluster, sorry for the swear word, they're gone now, all of them. They all went on to do other things. The team that I'm with now, they know their shit. They know what they're doing. I'm super happy to have them as teammates. Why is my reaction not working? That makes me sad. There you go. So that is why I am using Containerd. Uh, Containerd or Creo, that's what I would use. Um, there may be other container, container runtime engines. I don't know about them. <laughs> Let me know in the comments uh, if I should know about them. Those are the only ones that really matter, though, in my opinion. 